Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about diagnosing and troubleshooting laptops and portable devices. These requirements come from our CompTIA exam 220-601, section 2.3, both on 220-601, our essentials exam, and our 220-602, the technician exam, have very similar requirements where we are identify tools, basic diagnostics procedures, and troubleshooting techniques for both laptops and portable devices. You can see that section 2.3 and 602 exam go into a little more detail about using the tools that you have available to you. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the boot process itself and how we can troubleshoot it. We'll talk about video troubleshooting. There's some interesting things in there, especially with L CD. We'll talk about troubleshooting stylus and digitizer problems. You usually see those on those mobile portable devices. We'll talk about laptop keypad issues. And finally, something that's come up most recently in our technology, antenna wires and why those are important in these portable devices. Let's start with troubleshooting the boot process. Whenever you talk about, I can't see anything on my screen, it's not booting properly, what's our first response always? Is it plugged in? Do you have power? But it's not always an on and off kind of situation. We certainly hope it is, because then we can have our problem solved quickly. But usually, it's not quite as simple as the power just being on. And that's because in these portable devices, the power connection itself may have multiple cables. There's an external power supply. There's a lot of different pieces to this. So we need to check all of this all the way through. We need to check for lights. If many of the power supplies, those little power bricks that come with your laptops, have power lights on them. So you can see if they're getting power from the wall. You want to make sure that the cables plugged into them are snug, because the cables are also designed to connect and disconnect for easy transportation. For the DC power side that's coming out the other side of your power brick that's plugging into your laptop, there's no light on that one. So you may have to actually check it with your multimeter and see that you are getting some DC voltages down that particular power connection. And if it, you're in an environment where you have multiple laptops, maybe you just want to uh, swap out the power supplies. You have a known good power supply, swap it out and you see if you're having the exact same problem. You know, surges, lightning strikes, and other things can, can fry those power supplies pretty easily. And often, you just replace the one that you already have, and you're back up and running. Whenever you're booting the system, especially you're getting a message during the boot process, you know you've got power. You're working through the boot problems. Now you want to step through what you can do to resolve some of these boot issues. And one of the first things you want to do is just unplug everything from the laptop. I have on my laptop the option when it's booting to go out and look for any USB connected devices and boot from those. Because I have some USB keys that are bootable. That's just in the BIOS of BIOS configuration of my laptop. The problem, however, is if I plug in, for instance, my MP3 player, which plugs in via USB, it sees a USB hard drive, because that's what the music player looks like, but there's no operating system on it. So it won't boot. So I get this message. It just hangs. doesn't do anything. But if you unplug everything, it boots normally. So one of the first things you can do with your laptops is make sure there's nothing external that might be affecting that boot process. The other thing you want to check for is to see if there are any errors. And when these things boot, often these things fly by on the screen, a lot of different text. And these errors may disappear quickly. Hopefully, they stay on the screen long enough to see what's going on. But you may have to go back and look in the BIOS logs. Many BIOS have logs because of this very reason. Or there may be logs in the operating system that are identifying problems during the boot process. You can refer to those logs and see if there's anything that's changed or anything unusual about the boot process. Also, listen to what's going on. If you're hearing a clicking noise, perhaps there's a problem with the hard drive inside of your system. If you're hearing a beeping noise, that means that there is some type of error that is appearing. Maybe you're not seeing it on the screen, but the beeps are designed to give you feedback that don't require anything to show up on the screen. So you may want to check your manufacturer's uh, manuals, the information about that laptop, find out what those beeping noises actually mean. Whenever you're dealing with a portable system, there's usually some type of video output on it. And troubleshooting that type of video output's a little bit differently than if you're on a desktop system. The first thing is that it's an LCD screen, and it's not always on. You have the option to toggle it on and off or to send your output for the video through the video port that's on the external 
section of your laptop. And it's usually done through something called these function keys or FN keys. What these function keys do is allow secondary functions. The problem is that your laptops on these devices are so small that you can't put 100 keys on the keypad. You can only put 80 something keys. And so some keys have to do double and triple duty. So we've got this function key to allow these secondary or even the third type functions for these keys. One of them allows you to toggle between an LCD monitor that's internal and an external monitor or to have the same thing on both. And if you accidentally hit that key, you may find that it's a blank screen. This is one of those keyboards. Everything that is normally the, the white color is what it works on normally. But you can see these blue characters. In fact, you see there's a numeric keypad here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And if you hold down this blue function key right here, you're able to take advantage of those secondary functions. Well, if you look across the top, the function 8 key that's normally F8, when you're holding down the FN key, it is also a toggle between your CRT and the LCD that's in this laptop. So that's how you would toggle back and forth. So that's a good thing to check if you're not getting video. Here's a closer check of these little blue connections. Notice you can even accidentally hold down the function key and hit Escape, and it goes into standby mode. F1 goes into hibernate mode. So it's very easy to accidentally hit these things like your F8 and your video suddenly disappears from the screen. You have no idea where it is. Well, it's actually outputting out to your to your LCD port uh, or the video port on the back of your laptop. But if you don't have a monitor plugged in, you'd never know that. Another thing to look for on your laptop devices is something called an LCD switch. This is a physical switch that you can see that is somewhere close, usually close to the hinge on your LCD screen. This is what I call the refrigerator door effect. You close the door of the refrigerator, the light turns off. And when you open the door, the light turns on. And it all happens from the switch that's on the door itself. In this case, the switch that's on the LCD panel itself. This is a physical switch that you can see on older laptops. You can even push it down with your finger, and the LCD screen will turn off. You'd let your finger up, and the LCD screen will turn on. On newer laptops, it's a magnetic switch. It's built into the, the inside of the laptop itself, and there is no external physical switch. But they still go bad. You may have to replace those just so your LCD screen will turn on. Whenever you're working with that function key and that external monitor, you may see that there's a way to just go right to an external monitor. And the software that's in your computer allows you to do that with that function F8 key on my laptop, for instance. And what we can do is just, plug, if you're not getting anything on the screen, plug in an external monitor. Even if you normally don't use one, go ahead and plug it in and tell your laptop to send the video signal out that way. That way you can tell if at least the video card is working. Maybe the problem you're having is only with the LCD that's built into your laptop screen. When you're troubleshooting that LCD, sometimes what you're finding is that the backlight is not working at all. We can kind of see something on the screen, but the way that these LCD monitors work is there is a light behind the screen that allows you to see as the LCD changes. If that light goes out for any type of reason, you can't really see things all that well. It's very difficult to make out. So you may have to look very closely to see if there really is something on that LCD and you're just not seeing it because the light isn't turning on. If the light isn't turning on, you may have to replace uh, the LCD inverter. Occasionally, the entire display won't work. The LCD inverter that's here is also designed to power the rest of the LCD screen as well. So this is what an LCD inverter looks like. It's this tiny little inverter. And it's a power inverter. It takes the DC that's coming into your system and converts it to AC so that your LCD screen is able to use this alternating current. This inverter isn't something that you would normally have the end user swap out. You can see it's an electronic component. This requires dismantling the display of your LCD screen, replacing this inverter. It's not that difficult. It's a little more involved than some of the other things you might do, but it's not too horrible. And then putting everything back together. I think the hardest part is just dismantling the laptop and making sure all the screws go back in the right place afterwards. The actual changing out of the inverter is really just unplugging a few connections and screwing a new one back down. Down again. When working with LCD video, there's a few extra things you need to keep in mind. One is the, the resolution on the screen. If your screen of your laptop just isn't very crisp, it's very fuzzy, it may be that you're not running at the native resolution of the LCD screen itself. The native resolution always looks best. So try different resolutions and always refer to the manufacturer's manual just to see what this laptop does support on its LCD screen. 
However, not all laptops, even identical models, may have different configurations for their LCD screen. You may be able to upgrade the model you have when you're purchasing it and get a better or higher resolution screen. So even though they have exactly the same model number, they may have physically different LCD screens connected to them. So check and make sure that the video configuration in your machine is what you've set it to. Whenever you're working with portable devices, some of them have very unique input connections on them. And when you're working with uh, portable digital assistants, a number of them have the ability to touch the screen itself with a stylus. You'll very often run into this stylus and digitizer issues because this screen has to all be in sync. When you click a certain part on the screen, it has to be calibrated properly to know that's exactly where you're clicking. And if there's a problem with the calibration, it's not going to work the way you would like it to. You have this thing called drift. And over time, even though you calibrated it in the morning, it may be by afternoon that it's drifted a bit. And you're clicking in a spot that you know is the right spot, but it's not registering properly. And so especially older models of these styluses and digitizers that you'll see, they just will not sync up and they'll drift a lot. Uh, newer digitizers don't have quite that dramatic of a problem anymore, but they still need to be calibrated. There is a calibration process usually built into the device. And you can click a calibration key, and it pops up a screen like this that says, use the stylus and click right here in the middle of this target. And then it'll move it around. It'll say, now click down here. Now click over here. And by clicking on those different spots on the screen, it can triangulate and put in perfect synchronization where you're touching with what it should register. Working with keypads is a little bit a little bit easier to work with because it's something on a keyboard that we're accustomed to. But because there are so many different keys and function keys and second and third party functions on these portable keyboards, you want to check for the different lock buttons that are on there. One is the scroll lock. If you've ever worked with the scroll lock, you think it doesn't do very much. But if you're in a spreadsheet, it really is very useful. A spreadsheet you put on the scroll lock, and every time you move, it keeps your cursor in the same place and moves the spreadsheet around rather than you moving the arrow keys and watching the cursor move. So it reverses that process. Sometimes confusing, but it can be very useful once you get used to it. There's also an F lock, an FN lock, a function lock. It's called different things on different laptops. And as we've seen before, that performs those second tier secondary functions for those keys. Those were those blue keys we saw earlier. Now, there may not be a visual notification of these turned on and off or toggled on and off on your screen, on the LCD, anywhere on your computer. You may not know what a if your scroll lock is on and off. You may not know if the function key is on and off. You may not know if your caps button, your caps lock is on or off. And so you may have to just test it with the software you're using. Most laptops these days come with additional software you can load that will put a notice on the screen every time you touch one of those so you can tell whether you're turning it on or off. In this particular uh, keyboard, you can actually see these, these locks. Here's your function lock key. Here's the, the you can tell whether the function lock, the caps lock, and the num lock is on based on these, these, uh, these visual LED connectors, these green lights that are on there. But you can see the F lock key allows you to not just use the F12, but if you turn this on, it's also your print key. This is normally F11, but if you turn the F lock on, it's now save. This can be confusing if you forget that that's on because you're punching the F10 key to perform a function, and it's bringing up a spell check every time. You don't know why. It's because you just happen to accidentally perhaps hit that F lock key. Hitting it again will toggle it off, and then those go back to your normal function key uses. Another thing you run into is antenna wires. And antenna wires are usually on laptop computers, but it doesn't have to be this way. If it's a portable device, if it's a phone, if it's a PDA that has wireless capability or it's a laptop, there are antennas inside of it. Even if you don't see the antennas, there are wires inside of it. These days, they're usually internal to the device. And they're connected all the way through the case. They're usually on the top of your LED screen, your LCD screen. And they go all the way down to the bottom. They connect in through the bottom of your computer and all the way down to where your expansion cards might connect in through. So they're all the, running all the way through your case. If you're ever working inside there, you're replacing some memory, you're moving some things around in your laptop, they can very very easily be dislodged. So be very careful when working with your LED, your LCD screen, working with your memory upgrades, because it's very easy to disconnect those. Here you can see an example of these disconnected. This is a wireless card, an 802.11 card. And I've got the wires right here in my system. And you can see that they're just connected through these tiny little connectors. So you want to be very careful that they're very well positioned on there. And you don't accidentally bump them if you're doing anything else inside of your computer. 
In review, we've looked at troubleshooting our boot process for our portable devices, what we should look at when troubleshooting video. We've understood now a little bit more about how that stylus and the digitizer work on those portable devices. And we've looked at the laptop and keypad issues. And finally, the wires that are used to run the antennas for your mobile and wireless connections inside of your laptop devices. For more information, free videos, our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.